Alrighty, folks, you're about to listen to a bonus huddle, a specially curated huddle that we run once a month with experts sharing their insights into the topics that are most important to our huddlers. The expert at this particular huddle was Noah Breyer, founder of Brand.ai. He joined us to discuss how AI is transforming B2B content. Let's get to it. I'm really thrilled to introduce you to my friend, Noah Breyer. Uh, Noah's notable achievements include founding Percolate, now part of Seismic, and two other companies, including Brand.ai, which we'll be talking about in a little bit. As it happens, Noah started his career at a writer at this agency called Renegade, some of you may have heard of, in 2004. And what was amazing is that he had already distinguished himself as a journalist and an early blogger while he was at NYU, which blew us away. Um, four years ago, we did a couple episodes on his entrepreneurial journey. We'll share one of those in chat. So anyway, we caught up a few months ago and I wasn't at all surprised that Noah had, was starting something new in the AI space um, and had already written some code that integrated, I don't know if it was with ChatGPT or something, but we'll get into that. So naturally I thought, okay, if we wanna talk about generative AI and marketing, we really need to get Noah on the show. So uh, on, uh, on the bonus huddle. So Noah, hello, welcome. Thank you for having me. It's great. Uh, it's really amazing. I love talking to you, as you know. I mentioned you were an early blogger. I mean, this you, this is early 2000s, and it was about the Bears, the Chicago Bears, as I recall. And so I have to say, you know, you've been in New York a long time. Are you still a Bears fan? Do you still have that blog? Have you just been worn down? <laughs> Uh, well, I've been pretty worn down by the Bears. It's not been a, a fun uh, 15 years. Um, so I, I, at this point, I'm, I'm technical support for the blog. A good friend of mine is the full-time writer, and I basically have to fix WordPress every two months or something when something breaks. But that's, uh, that's the, the extent of my involvement, thankfully. Yeah, well, and you know, look, you also helped me get started with my blog and and how to do that back in 2008. We were early in this in this world of adopting. Let's just start with brand.ai. And for those who are not looking at it, it's brxnd.ai. What's your vision for that? Um, that is a good question. I'm still trying to figure it out. I think a little <laughs> bit broadly, you know, we've known each other for a long time. I, I really like brands fundamentally. Like I think they're sort of fascinating things. And um, I got swept up in AI stuff earlier in 20 last year. And, uh, you know, naturally I combined those two interests, right? I built a little fun, weird collab experiment where you could crash two brands together and, and make a, uh, a brand collab out of it. And it was all generated by AI. The marketing copy was generated by AI, but honestly, you know, as fun as that was, and it made really cool visuals. The thing that really struck me was that good brands consistently came out with better images. And like, at first that seems really obvious, but then when you think about it a little more, um, that means somewhere in there, it knows what a good brand is and that my, it's understanding of what a good brand is matched mine. And so then it became sort of an obsession with like, well, how does it know that? What does it know? Can it quantify that for, because if it knows it, it means it's quantified somewhere in there. Then I was off the deep end and like writing all this code and trying to extract what it knows. And I just got excited and got excited about talking to people. So then I decided I was going to put an event on. So I'm going to put a conference on in New York City in May. And I'm doing a bunch of other things and, you know, just exploring the world of AI. Uh, it, awesome. So Noah started his career as a writer, but uh, you wrote the initial code for Percolate, right? I mean, you taught yourself how to code. You sort of are, are one that loves getting into the sort of the technical aspects of these things and understand how they work and then manipulate them. I got 10 emails this morning about chat GPT. I mean, it's insane just this morning and everybody is talking about it. And I know that you've been playing with it and a lot of interesting things. So if we keep it broad for a second, how big a game changer do you think chat GPT is for marketers? First, I'd say let's sort of like 
zoom out of chat GPT. I think talking about it as chat GPT is a little bit of a tell about um, how you're viewing it. Underneath all this is machine learning. And these are a subset called large language models. And underneath chat GPT is a, a specific approach called GPT. Um, and, you know, most of my use, for instance, is not through the chat interface, but I write a lot of code that hits the APIs, which are the same APIs that the, the chat interface hits. Most of my interest, I, I'd say, is at the sort of large language model level, right? Um, I, I actually like have very mixed feelings about the chat interface itself but what these large language models can do is is pretty extraordinary and obviously a lot of the focus has been on the writing and you know getting them to publish blog posts or seo content or whatever and they're they're fine at that as long as you're happy with like very average content right because fundamentally like they're consensus machines and they're going to give you sort of consensus answers and um like average writing where i have found them to be absolutely extraordinary is in doing like much more basic tasks though so you know things like categorizing content like things categorizing uh taking like survey results and um categorizing them like um i've been doing a lot of web scraping and summarizing like those sorts of things that is like already in its current state that's a game changer like that is it can it has like solved a problem that I have wasted many days and maybe months of my life, like many, a whole bunch of problems I've wasted many days and months of my life doing. I don't think that it's at the point yet where it's, it's not ready to write great ads. Um, you know, it, it, it can be an interesting companion. I think like it certainly could be a helpful partner. It can get you started. And again, when you want consensus, like, uh, you know, I was talking to a friend yesterday and, and he had to write a formal letter to the city requesting something like your formal letter to the city is not judged on its creativity, right? It's judged on its formality and how close to the average it is that it's like perfect for that stuff. Right. Um, it's, it's really, really good for me, the day-to-day -day application where it's all using these models for doing data extraction that like either I had to do, or I had to write a lot of code to do, or I had to hire a bunch of people to do, or put it on mechanical Turk or something. And it's just done. It's solved. It's like absolutely extraordinary. I mean, it's, it, it is a little mind blowing considering how much time I've wasted, like trying to do this stuff in the past. So, and I want to dive into that because I think we've all sort of used it to try to write the newsletter. And I'm going to speak to that first. So, because you and I talked about this. So if I said, write a newsletter for B2B CMOs on content marketing or, or no, here's a more example, because we're talking about PR, write one on how to get the most out of PR. What it gives you is eight very basic and common things that are absolutely right. We'll call it marketing 101. It's not going to give you an insight for the moment, but still useful to make sure that you covered the basics, right? And so now, okay, how we, we got to get above that for general, for writing, but talk about what you're doing with a survey. Cause you know, I know lots of the CMOs listening to this are, they do surveys too, or they're gathering data, certain kinds. How specifically are you yeah. using it that way? You know, I mean, this is the kind of stuff it is like just amazing at. If you wanted to do, uh, so I did recently some really basic answer classification stuff, right? It's an open-ended question on a survey and you want to classify it across five buckets. Is it a positive? What kind of answer is it? GPT-3 is, is pretty capable of doing that well if you know how to prompt it to do it. And it's all about prompting it and telling it, hey, here, I want you to tell me which of these five, don't tell me anything else, but just tell me which of these five it falls into. And if it doesn't fall into the end of the five, tell me you don't know. And as if there's like good ways, that is a thing where we've all had to have people code surveys for us, right? Like it takes time and money and it's just done. The cost of it is, is something in the realm of like two cents per thousand surveys. You know, it's just like, it's, it's crazy, right? Like it's, it's, I it's sort of hard to comprehend. I'm just thinking about it. We literally were just working on a on a study for one of our clients, and there were 60 pages of verbatims, yeah. right? Yeah. And the way we would have done that before is said to an intern, try to classify these. Yeah. So now what you're saying is you take all those verbatims, you give them general buckets, and you say, and this is an important point I think we were talking about before the show, which is tell it if it doesn't know, tell it to not do anything. Right. Yes. And that's an interesting thing in and of itself. But so we have all these verbatims, we give it the categories that they could fall into, yep. and then it'll just sort them all out. It'll now, just sort them all out. It, and it's amazing. And if you want it to be really good, you can do a thing called fine tuning. And so that's another service that's offered through OpenAI. And 
what you do with that is like, if you have past surveys, you know, you're running a tracker over time, you have all these past surveys, you've already coded them all, then you're perfect. You give them 4,000 examples of how these things get coded. And then it is, it becomes extraordinary at, it'll never get it wrong, basically. Fine tuning. Yeah. Amazing. So that's a great example. So research, and that's one that I don't think people necessarily had, because that's sort of an advanced notion. Is there another thing like that? Because I think the, the uh, in, in is, is this um, every personal email that you need for board of <laughs> directors for the co-op board or whatever, but what other things are you seeing where the computational power yeah. is 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 just awesome well so one small one and it's like along those lines and it's probably not interesting for everyone but i'm guaranteeing some folks here uh is uh for doing uh like scraping and data extraction if you uh, uh say for instance you know you're a b2b company and you need to do research like you have salespeople who are doing research about their prospects and you want to be able to sort of take that company and look at a couple key things and then pull it into a format that you can prep the sales team or turn it into content. Doing scraping and and data extraction from scrape text is extraordinary. Like it's it's absolutely amazing. It'll give you you know like key value propositions or whatever you want to walk in with for your you know and include again. I think like worrying about it writing the content is much less interesting to me than like hey go take my five hundred prospects go scrape their home pages, bring me back their key message, their like whatever, you know, like pull out all of the things you need. And then, you know, we're going to use it in our account-based marketing campaign. Like we'll, we'll figure out how to include it. We'll write the content and that plugs in those pieces, but I'm going to have it go and take that, that raw data, right? Like just a page of text, structure it into whatever format I want, pull out key messages, pull out whatever it is. And it is extraordinary at that. I've done it. 10,000 times now. And it's like, I, I am <laughs> yet to have a day where it works and I'm not just absolutely amazed. Uh, I just did and, it right and, before. And so, and again, I, I'm going to emphasize, I want to spend some time on this because this is not a use case that I had been thinking about, but everyone listening in or, or watching in right now is thinking about how economy's down. How do we get the most out of every single interaction that we have with a prospect, right? How do we do that? One of the ways is to know the prospect better so that your interactions with them are more personal, more relevant. Um, and so how, I, and again, I'm not, you know, you don't have to pull up your screen and show, but how do you make sure that that is not just the basic? I've seen some in the past, a, a couple of years ago, where the assessments were so kind of basic that you went, okay, yeah, they're, this is their job title and this is where they work and this is what the company's per vision is, right? But yeah. it, it didn't get into any, there was no insight there. Well, I, again, I think it, it sort of depends what you want to be pulling out, right? I think that the way to use these tools is more as assistants than as insight generators. And that's probably like personally where I would start. So I probably wouldn't start with that question. I would start with, hey, uh, you know, I have to, we're going to do, you know, we have an ABM program going and like, you know, we're going to do, we have 200 companies in our ICP and like, he, I know all those companies, I have all their websites. I'm going to go hit all their home pages. I'm going to pull out their key messages messages. And then I'm going to go scrape their latest quarterly reports and pull out what were the sort of key business drivers and the key business concerns. And I'm going to put all that in the CRM so that when the salesperson calls and, or I'm going to plug it into my ABM so that I can actually like pull one of these key things out. It's still like the, this is a superpower, right? Like it's not, it's not a replacement for creative marketers, but like if you use that creativity to figure out like, what would I do if I knew everything, if I could know anything about any of the customers in my ICP, right? That's the part that's crazy is like, you know, you could go scrape every page of every customer in your ICP and pull down whatever information and it's just all there. I mean, I just, the thing I was doing right before this is um, 
somebody asked me if I could do it with PDFs. And so I actually figured out how to run it all with PDFs. So I'm grabbing PDFs off the web, like for case studies, and then I'm sucking out the content for the case study. And then I'm summarizing it down. So I have case study summary. I know what are their key customers and what do they solve for their key you know, and then obviously once I have that, it's now I know what I'm going to talk about with them, right? Like you, you put a case study on the web and you talk about what you solve for your biggest customer. That's the thing you're going and telling all your customers. So that's the thing I'm going to talk about with you. The thing that really helped me as you were talking was think of this as an assistant and anything that you might ask an assistant to do, it could do, and it probably can do it faster and better, assuming you give it really good guidelines. Right. Yeah. And that's part of this. So being able to, uh, Shelly Palmer uses the term prompt crafting, which I've immediately adopted yeah. and that, that that's a new skill set, right? Is that you yeah. need to understand. And so this means being able to direct your assistant to do that kind of thing. And I, and I would challenge, I suspect not a lot of folks have thought about necessarily looking at it from a, you know, looking at prospect case histories and, and sucking out that thing. It also occurs to me that there's gotta be a customer marketing application here in, right? I mean, you could do the same yeah. scraping, right? And I wonder how many of the folks that in, in CMO huddles that are listening right now are thinking about, wow, this could really be a leg up for every single customer engagement. Yeah. Amazing. It's it's really amazing. And, I, and so not only do you know them and, and so forth, but you probably know what's on their mind right now. Totally. Um, and you have, you know, you even have content from them that you can, and to them that you built for them that you can summarize. And I think take all this and, and, you know, sort of supercharge whatever it is that you want to do. I'm also just going to paste in into the chat. There's a, a piece I wrote, um, since you mentioned prompting, uh, I wrote up my favorite prompt, which for a while I was keeping secret because I wasn't positive that I wanted, uh, I wanted to share it, but I, I decided that like people are going to figure it out and I might as well try to get credit for figuring it out rather than keeping it secret. This is my sort of trick prompt for getting it to give me whatever I want in a very tight structure. Your trick prompt. All right. I can't look at it now, but I can't wait to see what your trick prompt is. How important, I mean, you know how to code and you sort of coding and isn't daunting to you. And I know this thing can code too, and we could probably go there. But in order to exploit this, does it help? I mean, should marketers be bringing in their coders to be thinking about this as well so that they could help take the maximum advantage of it? Yeah, that's an interesting question. There's sort of two sides to that. My prompt, actually, my my secret prompt is is inspired by code. So um, it's sort of inspired by the insight that these things understand how to code and they understand how to code just because there's more code on the internet than any other content, right? Actually, I remember this was a, a guy named Charles who worked at, at Renegade as well. And I talked in 2005 about the idea that like, you know, the thing that, that you know, is most prevalent on the internet is information about the internet, right? Like build the internet is, is the largest corpus of knowledge on the internet. And so it, it has a really good understanding of that. And so in fact, the prompt I use is a prompt that comes from a programming language called TypeScript, where I define the output that I want it to give it I want it to give me in, in sort of code terms, and it's able to perfectly understand that output and give me the output in exactly the way I want it. It's because code has these ways to describe things in very exact terms that you're able to make it happen. So, you know, I think on that side, that's just a sort of interesting anecdote where, you know, I was inspired by the ability to write code to find better prompts. What I'd say is... Um, the first thing I'd say to people, honestly, is like, you know, even before worrying about the code thing is move off ChatGPT and play in the OpenAI playground instead. So the OpenAI playground is a lot like ChatGPT. It doesn't have memory, which ChatGPT keeps some memory. So you can say like continue and do other things, but the playground doesn't, it's, it's kind of a direct access to the API. It also doesn't have some of the limitations of ChatGPT where you ask it to do for things, it'll always answer. The reason actually I suggest to use the playground though, is that I find it to be a much better reminder that 
this thing is not always like honest with you because it, it feels much more raw. Um, somebody called chat GPT, you know, the open AI API, the GPT three API with a necktie. Um, and I think that there's a lot of truth to that, that like this thing sort of masquerades with a necktie and you sometimes forget that you're talking to a robot. It doesn't really know anything. Right. Um, and so the playground, I think just gives you a sort of more raw way to interact with it. And, and I think gives you a better sense of sort of like how to get better at prompt writing. You know, on the other side, I'm a huge proponent of writing code. And, um, and in fact, like this prompt is all about the fact that it, you can get it to kick back responses in code compatible formats. And so you can integrate it into workflows in a way that is like amazing. Now, I also recognize that not everybody is sitting there writing code. And I suspect there's going to be more and more tools that come out that make this process much easier because there's a lot of stuff like, you know, one of the tricks that anybody doing any serious work with this is doing, for instance, is it, it's sort of come to be called prompt chaining. And so that's where you're, you're taking a prompt, you're getting an answer, and then you're taking that answer and you're feeding the answer back. So, you know, for my uh, brand collab thing, for instance, what I do is I take these two brands, I get it to write marketing copy, and then I feed the marketing copy back and I ask it to describe the product in the marketing copy. And then I take that and I get it to write a prompt based on the description of the product from the marketing copy. You know, so it's a three-step process where you're you're chaining prompts together. And ultimately, everything I would sort of argue almost everything interesting happening right now is happening with chained prompts. If anybody's played with Midjourney, for instance, um, which is a image generation tool, Midjourney is a it's one of the image generation tools, it's like Stable Diffusion or, or Dolly, if you've played with those, but it's way, way, way better. And the reason it's way, way, way better is apparently because they're doing a bunch of post-processing on your prompt to make your prompt better before it goes in. And nobody knows the secrets of how it's doing that, but it's doing something amazing. What comes out is like consistently extraordinary. I mean, I can't believe that this stuff you can kick out of mid journey. And I wish I knew what the secret prompt was so I could just go run it on one of these open source ones, but you know, they're not quick to give up those secrets. So chaining these things together and is, I think, it's like getting real work out of it. Like you're, you know, even if you're thinking about content building, like asking it to write long, one long article rather than getting it to build paragraphs. I, you know, paragraph by feeding it back on itself, I think you're generally going to sort of get better stuff with the latter, but you have to figure out how to, how to sort of chain them together. Uh, interesting. So before we get to visuals, because I do want to talk about visuals, the thing that occurs to me here is, is as a marketer, you know, the, the first thought, and I know a lot of CMOs are playing with it themselves, but there's a limitation to our ability to play with it because we don't really know what it can do and how to do some of the things that you know how to do. So I feel like that this that marketers will be smart to bring in somebody else who can think about this either from a research standpoint or from a coding standpoint, you know, maybe from your data analytics team, just to make sure that you're not just thinking about input output content, right? And thinking more about some of these other more larger, interesting things like the scraping that you define. I know that a lot of CMOs would love to be able to, first of all, a lot of CMOs have BDRs and uh, SDRs reporting to them, right? And they've got to come up with scripts every day and they're supposed to do research on the thing. Well, the research take time, so they probably don't. Yep. Now what you're saying is if you had the right prompts, it would it's, just sort of- It's solved. Like it's that problem, solved. You, like I, you could solve that problem in a few hours and like, you know, and then write a BDR script for- you know, four cents or something, you know, it's like, uh, it's, it's, it's mind boggling. So, yeah, but that is a really brilliant one. Cause that's a, that's a time suck that doesn't happen. And so you have these folks in the, in the, they call the customer and the customer has no idea who they are or their email isn't relevant. And what we're trying to do here is get to extreme relevance and, and ideally an insight, right. That you can use to further a conversation. So that's one thing Two. 
You talk about the cost of using this, and I know lots of the folks who have tried it here have only used the free tool. When you're talking about the cost, what are we talking? Is that using OpenAI Playground or some other? Yeah, what? the OpenAI Playground hits the OpenAI API. So the weird thing about ChatGPT is it's free, even though it's hitting the OpenAI API. That's why they're now throttling it and charging twenty dollars a month for the premium package. They have a bunch of APIs. They're all charged on volume. You get charged different amounts depending on how much you consume and which of the models that you use. So if you use their newest best model in its standard format, it's uh, two cents per thousand tokens. They charge everything in tokens. The, the uh, I can never quite remember what the token to word ratio is, but in my mind, I keep it as like a thousand tokens is a thousand words. I think it's more than that, but like, whatever, that's, that's a sort of basic idea. When I was saying like summarization, you can like our classification, you could generally do it for like, you know, a thousand for two cents. It's because I'm thinking like, you're going to spend essentially one token per classification. And so you're going to get a thousand of them for two cents, right? Like that's just the cost of it. And so, you know, these things can get expensive if you really, really start to do it at scale, or if you start to, I recently broke everything in my stack because, uh, I didn't realize that if you, so I was saying fine tuning, I, if you fine tune their most expensive model, it actually goes up to 12 cents per thousand tokens. I have a, a customer I'm working with right now who we are generating 5,000 synthetic dog breeds, AI generated dog breeds. And I had not realized that I was paying 12 cents per thousand tokens. And I ran through my limit and I had to ask them to let me spend more money with them. And everything was broken until they fulfilled my request. So that's uh, hilarious. Wait, so we're talking about German Shepherd meets the uh, Chihuahua. And, yeah, yeah. And, and so it's. We- it, it generates uh, it generates a description. It generates a a photo. It's really amazing. Hopefully, it'll launch in the next couple of weeks. But oh yeah, my god, that's cool. going to be! I think that would be a sh- Chihuahua. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. And but so that it, would it's be the actually, fun part. It's got a naming model too. So um, uh, it's a fine another. I use that fine tuning method where that's where you sort of you know you can think of fine tuning like you know how you prompt. GPT with here's examples of the kind of answer I want you to give it. Yep. The way to think about fine tuning is imagine if instead of prompting it with three answers, you could prompt it with 5,000. And so that's what you're doing when you're fine tuning it. Essentially, that's the sort of simple way to think about it is imagine if before your prompt, you had 5,000 good responses that it saw. And so now it was really good at knowing exactly the kind of response. And so, yeah, I, I fine tuned a model to dog crossbreed naming. I didn't realize that it was 12 cents per uh, per thousand tokens. And I, I ran through a lot of tokens pretty quickly. I had to beg them to let me pay more, pay them more money. And they, Amazing. they, uh, now, they were kind enough to say yes. <laughs> so just thinking about the dog breed, because one of the things that I found was that it, it really struggled with wordplay. It really struggled with any, like if you ask it to write a headline with wordplay or comedy, it just can't do it. Yeah. It really, I, and my favorite one, and, and our team laughs, I said, uh, write this in the voice of Jerry Seinfeld. The response was, hey, it's Jerry Seinfeld. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. That was it. That's all it could yeah. do. Um, so when you say that it's coming up with names for these dogs, you're, uh, is that just because it's sort of merging the best of the the two or you, you're, you have to give a pretty clear guidance, I imagine. Well, no. So, I mean, that's where I'm using the fine tuning technique, right? There are, you know, thousands and thousands of crossbreed dog names that are pretty cute, right? Um, and I went and grabbed many, 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 many of them. Um, and I f- took the model and I basically taught it how to where those came from, right? Because we know that, you know, whatever, a a golden and poodle is a golden doodle or whatever, you know, yeah, all those. And so I, I, you train it and the way you train it is the same way you write prompts. Essentially you give it a prompt and then, but you give it the completion, right? So in this case, I gave it golden plus poodle is a golden doodle. And so now it's learned and, and, you know, what these things do fundamentally, you know, at their lowest level is like they're pattern finders, right? They find patterns, you know, patterns we see, patterns we don't see, like, you know, all that kind of stuff. If you give it enough data, it finds the patterns in them. And so, yeah, I mean, does it kick out the cutest, best 
crossbreed names like no not always but is it like way better than i was getting out of the the basic model yeah way 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 better okay because you sort of trained it and taught it what to yeah. look for um you mentioned uh <laughs> excuse me open ai playground are there any other sort of copywriting tools whether it's jasper or others that you've played with that you think anybody else should test at this point there's definitely others that I think are doing interesting things. So if you go to writer.com, I think they're doing some interesting stuff. Um, I've also got a whole landscape of companies. If you go to landscape.brxnd.ai, um, and uh, I have a large, the biggest category is all these content generation tools. I have to be honest, like I, I'm not super impressed by the content output. Maybe it's some bias being a writer. I am personally much more interested in all these other things. So I haven't, I haven't found something where I've been blown away. I have done some SEO content because if you think about like, where does this thing, where does it not really matter where you, SEO content is content written for a machine, you know, you're writing it for Google's bot fundamentally. So, you know, I have definitely, uh, I've definitely used it for, for, uh, for that. I don't know. I, I haven't been blown away by any, as far as sort of the, the tools that exist out there, I think I just have a high bar for what good content is, I guess it's been harder. I think, you know, some of the stuff I can't do, I'm much more excited about. So, you know, I've like used a bunch of the, the image generation. I've done a bunch of the, you know, there's image editing ones that are really cool. Like, you know, I've set up a, there's a, one that uses AI to remove image backgrounds and I've got it as part of a workflow where I need to remove image back. You know, it's just like these little annoying things. I use uh, Dolly and the collab thing. I haven't found a single one where I'm like, wow, this is really significantly better than everything else. So the key takeaway here for all of these things, one is think about it the, just as an assistant for almost anything, anything that involves taking data and collapsing it into something that you can use in one form or another as an assistant, which is really a very valuable framework to have when approaching all of this. I was going to move right into visuals, but you said something that I just, I, I felt like I needed to um, address, but I'm going to keep going. All right, let's talk visuals in terms of, uh, I'm thinking of, oh, I know, I don't know. I'm sorry. I got to go back. Okay. For blog posts for SEO. <laughs> And we're talking about machines consuming it, but these blog posts go on your website and someone might read it and a customer is going to say, well, that's basic. What, how are you, how would you manage that? I'm sorry to give you that very specific use case. I, I don't know. Maybe this is my own expectation, but I sort of always expect those blog posts to be pretty basic. They're a way to get somebody to your website. And when I land on a website, it's not necessarily that I'm looking at that specific content. Um, you're just trying to get people deeper. So, you know, I did do a thing recently where I I took within the category that, you know, my landscape is in and uh, looked at all the most common questions out of the SEO tool that I use and then, you know, wrote, like had the assistant write content based on some existing content. It's not entirely sort of generic. I, you know, it like includes some information about me and what I'm doing. I produced a bunch of SEO content you know, with the goal of, of getting up in some of those key questions. I was looking at question search terms in, in that particular one. Right. So almost like FAQs and that kind of thing. Okay. And so I just set up a whole pipeline. Like I, I took the, you know, CSV out of the SEO tool and, um, and loaded all those question keywords in, and then just had it churn through them all. And, and boom, then those are blog posts. Amazing. Yeah. Okay. All right. Let's talk visuals. What's blowing you away right now? Um, how have you, and how are you using them? Basically, the way to think about it, you know, I think the market right now, you know, as far as sort of what's out there the most is you have MidJourney, um, uh, which you can only use through Discord. You have OpenAI with Dolly. Dolly is the one with the best API um, and the easiest to use. And then you have a bunch of open source, you know, Stable Diffusion is sort of the biggest. There, there's a bunch of other players too. There's a new one called Playground AI. And Playground AI has been integrating a bunch of additional new, additional models that are pretty neat. Like they, they were the first ones to sort of publicly release a new text to edit model where you could take an image, write text, and it would edit the image based on what you asked it to do. Drew's holding an orange and I want Drew to be holding an apple. And so I say, you know, make him hold an apple and it'll change the orange to an apple. And so that one's at, that's at Playground AI. For all my collab stuff, I, because I needed an API, I'm using uh, uh, Dolly. And what I'd say about Dolly, if you've played with it, and you know, it, it's really true of all these things, like except for Mid Journey. Mid Journey is just, 
you can get good content out of mid journey without knowing anything about prompting. Um, that's what makes mid journey amazing. It's like, you can give it a pretty terrible prompt and it will, if you give stable diffusion or Dolly a terrible prompt, it will give you reasonably terrible results. But if you give stable, if if you give mid journey, a terrible prompt, it'll still give you amazing stuff. Um, but with Dolly, you know, it's all about learning how to prompt it. Well, so, you know, for that, the trick is, uh, and I'll, I'll share all these links too, but there's a bunch of prompt search engines now. That's the best way to learn how to do the image prompts is you just go hit those prompt search engines. You find images that you find interesting and you look at how, I mean, and it's amazing when you look at some of these prompts that people are doing in some of these, uh, in some of these search engines, it's, it's like totally extraordinary. And, and, you know, I actually, I did this thing. I, I taught a class over the weekend at university of Montana, and I've had this notion for a while since playing with these things that you could use these image models as a really interesting teaching tool, because the way to get good results out of them is to have lots of, have a really deep understanding of both the vocabulary of aesthetics, but also the sort of history of the aesthetic you're after. So like the more inspirations you can give it. And so when you look at some of these in the prompt engine, if you know a director whose style is famous for this, they'll put that director in, right? And there's all these things where, and so I did a, I did an exercise with the students this weekend where I gave them a, a sort of like, a, you know, I gave them the Vertigo poster, the famous uh, Saul Bass Hitchcock poster. I didn't tell them anything about it. I don't think anyone had ever seen Vertigo before or knew about that poster. And I asked them to make a new one about a, a movie about a killer grizzly bear because it's a the Montana grizz. They immediately go in and they found who, you know, you, the first thing you figure out is like, okay, if I tell it Saul Bass, now it makes a better image, right? And so they figured out it was Saul Bass and then they went and found other aesthetic terms. I think that part of it is amazing. I would really just kind of poke around on these image search prompt search sites and, and, you know, find ones that you think are interesting. The prompting can be very specific to the, um, to the tool you're using. So you just have to sort of be aware of that. Like, and they all have filters. So you can say, Hey, just give me mid journey prompts or just give me, just give me a uh, Dolly prompts or whatever it is. Amazing. And so, you know, having it, this is so interesting because I think it's the same with the writing, but the more, you know, about design, because you and I've worked with like on logo redesigns and those people who do that have a million words for yeah, every yeah. little part of, yeah. of a letter. Right. Yep. And and so I am imagining that that same kind of expertise in terms of just art and art style, if you bring that, you're going to get more out of the tool. Is is totally what yeah. I mean, because think about like how does it know what it knows? It 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 knows it from the internet, right? It scraped the whole internet basically, right? And so that's how it came to understand things. And so these words are all used on the internet, and like you know, you think about it, like it knows the aesthetics of Picasso. Um, uh, because there's so much Picasso, it knows, you know, it can do great Van Goghs because there's so much Van Gogh, right? Like, so, you know, you just have to sort of put yourself in the model's head in a way where you're like, Hey, you know, what would it know a lot about? It's not going to know as much about this niche designer from the, you know, early eighties or whatever. Um, you know, you, you have to prompt it with things that it will likely know about the more internet, <laughs> the better, you know, I mean, that's been one of the really interesting insights from all the collab work I've been doing is it can reproduce brands, even really small brands that are very online, sometimes better than really big brands that are not as online. So it's like um, a friend of mine runs a small record label called Ghostly, which is whatever, it's big if you're into electronic music, but it's certainly a lot smaller than something like Costco. But I would argue that like it has a better sense of Ghostly's aesthetic because it's sort of more on the internet than it does Costco's. Um, but it, if you think about what is the corpus of this thing, it can kind of make sense, right? Like this is Ghostly has a big e-com store and they put out lots of product. You know, it's like Costco's whole strategy is get you to come into their big warehouse. And, you know, that's one interesting thing is it, that just have it assess the design of your brand yeah, <laughs> and then say, and do it. And then you'll kind of know it's an interesting litmus test. If your brand has a design and has a thematic and has a look and yeah. feel, you'll find out right away, right? Well, so I'm, yeah, I, I hope to have a tool that does that in the not too distant future. I've been playing with exactly that. And I think that question is fascinating. One of the things I find most interesting about this for marketers is, um, you know, I think a lot of the, obviously a lot of the conversation right now around chat GPT and education and all these things is about it telling you false information. And the reason for that is like, there is no 
true or false information to this thing, right? Like it, it's just a consensus machine. It's sort of like it's building up strength of association. But in marketing, like that is truth, right? Like we, this is a place where like what's what's actually factual is not important. I sent a friend, I've been playing with this tool to where it, it tells you what does the large language model perceive? I've been, it, what does the large language model perceive your competitors to be? And why does it perceive them to be you? Why does it think they beat you, right? And so I sent it to a friend of mine at a brand and it said that, you know, it said his biggest competitor was, and it said they beat him because they have better selection. And he's like, well, that's not true. They don't have better selection. And I'm like, okay, but like, do people think that's true? And he said, yeah. yeah. And I was like, well, that is true, man. Like it doesn't like what's, you know, in this particular problem, what's what's actually factual is not, is not really relevant. Interesting. Cause it's just out there. And so I'm now getting to how you can use this to better understand your current brand, where you are relative, your competition and what you think is really truly differentiated. I mean, and what the perception because it's going to feed back the perception, right? That's exactly. It's going to feed, and and perception is reality when it comes to brands. Yeah. God, okay, that's amazing too. Uh, yeah, so it's like, you know, it's a, con I, I keep, I, I sort of talk about it, it's a consensus machine, right? It's going to give you the consensus. And and if you're a marketer, most of the time, like that's what you really care about is the consensus. Well, it's, right? at least you want to know what that is yeah. because you, you got to beat it. I mean, you, yeah. if you want to change it, you have to do something. Yeah, yeah, right? exactly. And, yeah. and uh, you know- If it's... anybody wants me to kick out their brand from this thing, uh, I'm very happy to send them a, it's, it's not quite ready for prime time yet, but I'm happy to send them a readout from uh, basically what is the large language model now? What does the law large like? We have covered a lot of ground in a short period of time. So we've talked about, you know, using it to write software, using it to create visuals, using it to create sort of FAQs. I'm imagining that it could do tutorials pretty well, right? It certainly can answer product questions easily. Are there other applications that they should be, that, that marketers should be testing? One we just talked about, which is, your brand image. Do you have yeah. one? <laughs> yeah. I think that that sort of stuff is fun. Like trying to, trying to get a sense of what it knows about your brand. You could get a lot of other stuff out of it too. So the one other thing I will say on this and an area to explore, and, and I actually think a like hugely underappreciated tool right now, because it, it's hard to use still is uh, there's a thing called embeddings. Um, and so this is another a API that OpenAI offers and embeddings. The way to think about it is, um, you know, what's sort of sitting underneath all of these models is they look at something and they break it into lots of different dimensions, right? Um, and lots of different criteria. So they might, you know, snap a photo of you, Drew, and like blue is one and microphone. But there are many, 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 right? And it takes all of those and it crunches them down and it uses to place you in, in space, right? In this like multi-dimensional space. Okay. Um, and they have an API that lets you take out the that analysis directly so they give you the placement of you know in this case drew in space and what you can do with that is pretty amazing so like you know you that's how semantic search works for instance so like i do a thing on my landscape where if you type in a use case i will tell you which companies are best suited for that use case and i do it by they all have a location in this multi-dimensional space and then i use a database that tells me which one is closest to your search and you're able to locate it. But I've also been playing recently with, I just give it a bunch of brands and it, I'm, cause I'm curious, like what is its intuitive understanding of the brand space? Like how does it see brands arranged and like, how does it understand categories? And generally it's very good. Like it understands categories intuitively. It places brands in the same category in clusters together. But what's really interesting then is like, why does it place other brands near those brands? Um, and you can just do, I mean, the embedding stuff is like, you know, we're just at the sort of beginning of that and it's still, there's not really a super accessible way to do it, but it is, it's to some extent, I think like that's some of the most mind blowing stuff that I have played with, um, is like actually looking at that because there are a lot of use cases and I could say something I've written about that as well. Okay. Uh, Johan Abadi from Process Maker. Johan, you had a question. Yeah, I had a question. Noah was uh, was talking about the uh, content being produced by some of the tools that he used. There was mediocre. I convinced my content team to use Jasper before everything was blowing up in November, and you had a lot of resistance from them. You know, 
content writers should be uh, should be the ones writing the content. And uh, I had a lot of pressure on producing more content. I just didn't have enough resources to uh, make it happen. The right cost. Push really hard, made it a requirement for them to test it on the blog post, an email, and uh, to summarize uh, a white paper. Everyone was blown away. So now my content writers are doing editing more so than pure content writing. So we do ideation, we do write some paragraphs, they do editing, and then we publish it. So have you seen more people who are successful with this? Because we are successful with that, yeah. uh, with that playbook. Yeah, I think totally. I guess, yeah, I, I probably should have been more specific. I think to me, what you're describing is sort of more along the assistant lines where, you know, you're doing the editing, you're having it do things like summarization, like, yeah, those are what it's amazing at. I just don't think generally, like you're going straight from content to publish. And I haven't seen it, it produce. I think that makes perfect sense. Like having it come up with ideas for content is is really good any of us who have ever had to publish a bunch of blog posts or whatever like figuring out what your next one is going to be is often the hardest part like it's often harder than actually writing it just putting 15 ideas in front of you and just like giving you a head start is great and so yeah i i think all of that totally makes sense i my comment was much more specific like i just you know like i think i still think you've got to put in real work but yeah i mean if you've got a content you team you need to make them more productive like this is like every one of them having an assistant right like a sort of For junior sure. writer who is a part of their team and is able to do you know it's like it's perfect hey yeah. it's the best writer writer's block uh, buster that i have found totally, for yeah. sure we have one more question and then we're going to wrap up so when you think about the skills that a cmo needs to have on their team to take advantage of the various we'll call them generative ai tools what should they be looking for yeah, that's a, uh, I like that question. You call, I can't remember exactly what you called it, but um, you know, there is a new job emerging called prompt engineering um, that showed up in a, a bunch of places. I've been playing this role a little bit. And I think that this is something people will probably have full-time in house is like someone who is sort of floating around and trying to figure out where can we do things with this and how can we integrate it better. And it's probably like they write a little bit of code and they are really good at prompting and they can sort of like tie it into the workflow of the organization. Honestly, I think like you could hire that person today and see it have a huge impact. My own personal experience is, is that I now, you know, because I'm in the headspace, I now I'm finding things every day where I'm like, oh, wow, I can just like, I, can I really just pump all that through and like solve that whole problem for myself? And, you know, oh, well, if I just had this one piece, then I could, and I just think, you know, it can be a huge unlock. That's the secret. I think this is why Microsoft is calling it, uh, it started with GitHub for their coding assistant. They called it Copilot, right? And I, how can you add these things as a sort of a copilot, an assistant that can sit alongside all these processes and, you know, help everyone on the team? I'm sure many of you are technology CMOs. Every technology company, the promise is like, we're going to sort of let you focus more time on the things that you matter more, right? We're going to sort of eliminate the busy work. And, you know, I just, I, this is, this is that times a thousand. Like this is, this is very truly delivering on that. Yeah. Solve this problem. Look at this data, do this. So I think the thing that's so interesting and expansive of the way to think about this is we've been focused on copy. We've been focused on visuals, at least I have in the conversations we have, and we need to think, start with what are our biggest problems right now? And our biggest problems right now are, for example, BDR is getting the customer to demo. That's a big issue because if you're if you're not taking it, you know, that lead doesn't become a, a real genuine prospect. Or our biggest problem is just uh, figuring out what content is the stickiest or, or getting more content. Whatever those are, there is a chance that this uh, can play a significant role in speeding up your ability to solve that particular problem. And that's the that that's the mind blower here for me, is just think more expansively about this. And, you know, Noah and I started this conversation talking about, are we at the explore stage or the exploit stage? And it feels like we're somewhere in the middle, but just it, because it's a, because you can just get into this vortex and keep playing and playing and playing, let's align it with your priorities and then use it to the, for those priorities. So before we wrap up, Noah, two do's and a don't when it comes to generative AI. Two do's and a don't. You just said it, but like, think of it as, as your assistant, not, not your replacement for your humans. Probably the second do is just 
just go play, like go play. This is going to be so big. And the opportunity right now to just get your hands dirty and tinker, you know, is, is massive. Um, you know, uh, I think the don't is probably just don't get too caught up in the sort of, um, don't get too caught up in the conversations and the hype. The reason we're talking so much about content is because that's where the conversation has gone. But I think the more you play with it and get your hands dirty, the sort of more of a realistic understanding you get from it. And so it's like, read all the coverage and all those things, but make sure you temper that with hands-on experience. Yeah. Use it and learn how to do it. All right. Noah Breyer, thank you so much for joining thank us. You. Where can people find you and learn about your upcoming conference? I'll put the conference link in, but it's brxnd.ai. The X is at the intersection of brands and AI. So there's lots of stuff there and I'll be having a conference in May in New York City and would love to have everybody there.